my set here. Yeah, I'm set here as well. Good morning and welcome. I'm glad you're here to, to worship the King with us this morning. Um, for those online, we're glad that you joined us as well. Just a reminder that today is Communion Sunday, so if you're at home and you don't have some, maybe a, you know, some bread and some juice or whatever collected, maybe you want to go and gather that up here um, so you have that ready for at the end of service. We'll take communion as a family, as a church. A um, couple quick announcements before we get started. Mats for missions. Um, the collection bins are there as you go out to the right. There's little bins on the floor to be able to collect those grocery bags from Econo or Walmart, all those things that we pile up everywhere. Um, they're actually going to get converted into mats um, for the homeless. So if you have any questions about that, you can see myself or Lisa Ruman here up in the front. Um, she'd be more than willing to or take a look at it online, um, see what that's all about. Sweetheart's Dinner, February 14th, um, 6 p.m. So the ladies of the church, 18 and above. Um, it's just an opportunity for us as men of the church to serve you, um, to just thank you for all that you do in our lives and in the church. So February 14th, Sweetheart's Dinner, 6 p.m. Um, any questions, you can see myself, give me a call, whichever. Uh, and then Baptism Sunday, February 21st. If you've never taken the step of baptism and you feel like, hey, you know what, now's the time. I feel like I need to take a step of obedience to what, for, and display what God has done in my life and who he is to me, and I want the world to know that you know, he is my all in all. Sunday, February 21st, um, as part of the service, there'll be an opportunity to do that. Um, there again, you can see myself or one of the elders. Um, we can get you a packet. We'd love to sit and chat through that, um, what that looks like, and help you to take that step of baptism and obedience to our Father. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer, um, and we'll get into worship. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you that we are who you say we are. Lord, I pray that as we go through today, through the worship, through the word, that you would truly, Holy Spirit, that you would sink our identity deeper into who we are. That we would truly understand it, not just understand it intellectually, but that we would truly start to believe it in our heart, God, that we are truly your children, that we are beloved, that we are ambassadors, that we are called out ones, that we are, you name it, God, there's so many aspects of our identity throughout, the, throughout your word. I pray, God, that you would draw us to that. And that as we start to become aware of who we are, we start to live out of that. And as we live out of that, God, it brings you praise, honor, and glory from those people we come in contact with and from ourselves alone. So, Lord, would you be lifted high in this place today? Jesus, we desire to make much of you because you've made it possible for us to be called sons and daughters of our Father God. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just want to stand, we're going to worship Jesus this morning.
so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. To you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Rejection could never earn it. You did what we don't deserve it. You take the broken
Go You go before. 
Psalms 1, 39. I'm going to read it out of the Passions Translation. It says, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and my soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my head. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like it's an open book, and you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. This is just too wonderful, deep and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings wonder and strength. For where could I go from your spirit? Where could I run and hide from your face? If I go up to heaven, you're there. And if I go to the realm of the dead, you're there too. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you're there. And if I fly into the radiant sunset, you're there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It is impossible to disappear from you. It is impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me. For your presence is everywhere, bringing light into my night. There is no such thing as darkness with you. The night is, to you is as bright as the day. There's no difference between the two. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside. You wove them all together in my mother's womb. Oh, thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelous. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully, shaping me from nothing to something. You saw who created me to be before I even became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you are thinking of me. How precious and wonderful that is to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. And when I awake each morning, you're still with me. I just feel like the Lord this morning wants you to know that he knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the parts that you don't want to tell anyone. He sees the trials. He sees the pain. He sees the joy. He sees the seasons where you continue to press in, even though you had nothing. And he sees the season you're in now that's full of lightness. He sees it all. You're never lost. You can never disappear from his eyes. His eyes are on you. His eyes are on you. If you give him all the pieces, he will put you back together. I just feel like this morning he's asking you to give him all the pieces so that he can put you back together. We have the choice. We can withhold pieces of ourselves from him. He's asking you, do you want to be put back together? Do you want to know who you are? Because he wants to tell you. He knows. <laughs> he knows. So often we don't know and we're looking to everywhere to define us. He knows. He knows. He knows who you are. He knows who you are. He knows your name. Yeah. So we're going to sing this chorus. It's really simple. And I just pray that it would root in your hearts this morning. These couple simple words that they would go deep. That I know they're simple and maybe seem repetitive, but I feel like the Lord just wants you to get this. To get it deep. To not just let it sit up here, but to go here. So we're going to sing this. I just want to encourage you to join in. Ask the Lord to impress this on your heart this morning. Yeah. You know me oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. You know me oh, oh, oh. oh. Oh, 
that in this short time that you have come to define us that when we come to you with every piece you put it back together that we don't have to fear coming to you with things that we think you don't know about because you see it all you see every detail and we can't disappear before you there's not a moment where your eyes are not on us Jesus you don't just leave us and just say figure it out you're right there you are the defender you are our champion we rely on you jesus it's not it's not in our own strength <laughs> that we fight our battles it's not in our own strength that we gain new qualities or define ourselves it's in you it's in you that we have identity it's in you that we find our meaning and our purpose I pray that this morning you would continue to identify us just through the message, Jesus. That you would mark us. You would mark us as ones who know that we are your children. You would mark us as ones who know that we are loved. That we are your sons and your daughters. That we are heirs. We are ambassadors of Christ. Deeply loved. That we are the beloved. The bride. But this is who we are. And that the lies of the enemy would begin to be washed off. That you would wash us in your word this morning. That you would cleanse us. That you would cleanse our hearts. That you would search our hearts, oh Jesus, and know us. And do the heart surgery that's necessary to take out the lies of the enemy that has stolen things out of our lives. That we would walk in our calling. We love you in this place, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you that you don't leave us. We thank you that you break down every wall. That you don't give up on us. That you're in the process. We love you, Jesus. We love you in your name. All right, good morning. Um, I guess there's a question. Do you believe that song? Do you really believe that you're a child? Deep down at the core of your being, do you believe that you're a child of God here this morning? Right? Because I think if we don't understand that, I think that's the core identity that God wants us to, to get deeper than any other one that's out there. Not that it's more important or whatever, but, it, but at the same time, I believe it is because if we're a child of the Most High, is there anything that He can't do? Is there anything that he won't provide? Is there anything that is too, too much for him, too, you know, too great for him? I would say no. Right? And so if we know that we are his child and we know that he gives us good gifts, right, so often then we need to start to live out of that identity. But I think what we'll find out today as we go through it, I think sometimes we believe that we're not children. And I think it's because the enemy has done a great job of trying to convince us otherwise. He has spent centuries and decades and you know, time upon time trying to convince us that we're not. And so if you weren't here last week, we opened up a series on identity. Um, we're going to be on it for a little while here. Um, if you are on Facebook, you probably saw a post or Instagram that was out there. That has nothing to do with me. I'm not on Instagram at all. Uh, but my daughter is good at it, so I gave her a quote and asked her to post it out there um, by Kenneth Bower. It says, we cannot consistently behave in ways that are different from what we believe about ourselves. And let me repeat that. We cannot consistently behave in ways that are different from what we believe about ourselves. So if I don't believe that I'm a child of God, if I don't believe that I am a bastard, if I don't believe that I am beloved, I will not consistently live out of that identity. I can do it in spurts and spasms, right? And I can, I can do really good for a while, but if I don't really believe that that's who I am, eventually I'm going to revert back. And you're going to revert back to what you believe about yourself. I'm no good. I'm not loved. 
I can't be an ambassador for God because that's not who I am, right? And eventually we're going to find ourselves slipping back into those because maybe that's what we truly believe about ourselves. And I think through this series, God is trying to rewire those things and try to change our mindsets in it. Eric Geiger in a book on identity says, attempting to live out our faith without first understanding our identity leads to a legalistic faith. Attempting to live out our faith without first understanding our identity leads to a legalistic faith. And, and all that is because is if I don't truly understand that I, am, you know, that I am these things that we've talked about already here this morning, I am going to work my butt off to achieve it. And I'm going to do everything in my effort and go, you know what, guess what, I'm going to earn my way to being a child of God. And you know, no matter what it is, and I'm going to be the most obedient person there is, and I'm going to do everything he asks me to do, and I'm going to prove, and I'm going to become this child of God. And he goes, that's not the way it works. All that that kind of faith leads to is a legalistic faith when we don't first understand that regardless of what I do, my Father already says I love you. And it doesn't depend on me, and it doesn't depend on you, right? Our faith isn't what causes God to love us. He loves me because He loves me. And He loves you because that's what He desires to do, and He, and he, and he pours that out on us as His children. And thus then we live out of that identity and become, you know, who we are. Our identity, I really truly believe, changes how we act and how we live out our faith. I do. I think it's, it's crucial that we start to grasp some of these attributes because I think once we do, like I said, we'll live it out. I, I go back, and it's a long time ago, Jim Kent, who's kind of an adopted set of parents to us as a family, he always used to put it this way. He used to say, it's the difference between I have to and I get to. But as a son or a daughter of the king, as one who knows their position and knows their identity, when God asks them to do something, they go, I get to. I no longer have to. Right? I get to do these things. I get to bring pleasure and praise and honor and glory to my God. I don't have to. Right? And that's a big mindset shift in the church. It's a big mindset shift in each one of our lives from the standpoint of, well, I just have to. Well, I'm just this. No, you're not. You get to participate with what God is doing in your life. What, what God wants to do, how he wants to advance his kingdom through that. So again, un- identity will impact how you live and it will impact how I live. Identity will enable you and I to enjoy your freedom in Christ. Right? And, and believe it or not, right, Christ has died to bring us freedom. Right? He's died to set us free. Right? But yet so often, I myself don't live in the fullness of that freedom that he purchased because I'm still stuck over here going, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not that. He goes, would you accept that? He's saying the same thing to you this morning. And ultimately, it'll bring glory to the Father. So let me ask you a question. Right? Who is your Father? You're like, well, that's easy. Right? If, I, you know, if you were to ask me that from a, from, a, from a physical standpoint, my dad is Chris Genghis, right? and that's no big deal. That is my Father. Right? That is my, my physical Father. Right? And you probably heard the common assertion that we're all children of God. It's not a true statement, church. Right? And that, that might be hard to accept. Maybe you're sitting here going this morning, no, that's not true. Or, no, we're all made in God's image. Right? There isn't a one of us here this morning, there isn't a one of them out in the world right now that isn't made in God's image. But being made in God's image doesn't make them a child of God. Right? There's a big difference between the two. And I, and I think we want to believe that we're all God's children because if we're all God's children, then that means we're all saved. Right? That means we're all good, where our tickets are stamped, we'll spend eternity together forever. Unfortunately, I think what we'll look at today and what we'll see today as we go into becoming a child of God and who our true, heaven, you know, who our true father is, right? that, I, that, that, that lie that the enemy has planted out there that we're all children of God has convinced some people that they don't need to do anything. And I think it has convinced the church that if they're all children of God, it's, it's, it's taken away the absolute desperate need for us to go and share the gospel. If everybody's a child of God, then I don't, I don't really need to do anything. And I think if you've been in the church very long, you realize that that's not true. Because in reality, there's two fathers out there, right? There's two fathers in the world in the grand scheme of things, God or the devil. Right? We have, all have physical earthly fathers, but in a spiritual sense, right, either we're children of God or we're children of the devil. You're sitting here this morning going, you're telling me that before I came, we came to Christ, right? before I became a Christian, I was a child of the devil? Yes, I am. So was I. 
Right? That is the status of every one of us apart from Christ. We're children of the devil, and that's not me speaking. That's what the Bible says, and we're going to look at several instances where Jesus calls people children of the devil. Paul calls people children of the devil, right? John says there's people that are children of the devil. There's two fathers out there in the spiritual sense. We need to make sure which one is ours because there's really only two kingdoms out there as well. Right? There's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. One author puts it this way about the, you know, the two fathers. He goes, either we're a child of God by grace, marked by love and righteousness, or we're a child of devil by nature, right? marked by lack of conviction and repentance. So either we're a child of God by grace, or we're a child of the devil by nature. Every one of us came out with a sinful nature. Every one of us came out corrupted because of what Adam and Eve did back in the garden. Right? We are all by nature fathers of the devil. And then God breaks in and he starts to change things around and he sends Christ. And so maybe this morning, you know, talking about fatherhood, talking about submitting to ourselves, talking about being children, maybe that doesn't um, drop a good picture in your mind. Right? Maybe your, your, your childhood wasn't that good. Right? I know I'm not going to convince myself for a moment that we all had perfect childhoods and everybody understood that they're loved by their fathers and all that's good. It's not. I know that. I didn't know that that's not true. And when you look at the plague of fatherlessness in our society today, you start to realize why this child of God identity is so hard. And you start to realize that the enemy of God, right, that the devil has been working from the beginning to destroy fatherhood. Because if he can destroy fatherhood here, how much more difficult is it to find it here? Right, guys, in this room, right, if you're a father this morning, right, I, I, you can say it's not fair. I don't, I don't like it either. But a lot of how we interact with our children either sets them up for easier success to accept Father God or to struggle with Father God. It's really true. Right? How they interact with us as their earthly father has a huge impact. And when you start to look at some statistics, I'm only going to share a couple of them. In 2018, so just a few years back, 19.5 million children lived without their father. One in four. Right? One in four children in our society Lives, up, lives and grows up without their father figure in their life. Hmm, sounds like the enemy's doing a pretty good job, no? The enemy's going, look, it, you know, the church is telling you, pastor's telling you that your father loves you and, you and you're a child of his, and you're going, huh, I don't want anything to do with the father. Let me tell you about mine. And if God is anything like mine, I'm out. I don't need that again. And that's the lie that the enemy has perpetrated from the get-go. 35% of kids are being raised in a single-parent home. One in three. And we go, well, maybe that doesn't identify us here. Maybe we don't have that in, the midst, in our midst of us. But one in three kids is raised in a single-parent home, and most of them is without the father. And if they have a father, it's not their birth father. And as I've gone through many different trainings, there is a, there is a part of our core identity that you know, that comes from Father God, but is given to Father me, right, that our kids struggle with. And when, our, when we as earthly fathers maybe abandon our kids, in their subconscious, they say, I'm not lovable. I'm not approved. How can anybody possibly love me? My own father couldn't love me. But that's a battle. And that's why I say the enemy has done a great job of attacking the fatherhood because if he can attack that and get a bad image in, in people's hearts and minds about fathers, it can be very difficult for people to come to Father God when it's needed. Right, to start to understand that our Father God is a loving God, He's a caring God, He's a faithful God, He's a trustworthy God. All those things are true and amen in Christ. Right, that's who He is, but we struggle with that because of our own circumstances. So bringing us back here for a minute, Right? If we're apart from Christ, that means our father is of the, or that our father is the devil. And if you think about the devil, he's what? He's abusive? He don't care about anybody else, really, does he? Does the enemy really care about anybody else? You, he's convinced us, I think, that he cares. <laughs> I think he does a pretty good job. You know, no, I'm watching out for you. No, you're not. Right? That's not true. Right? You might be out for me in the moment, but there's a long-range picture here that you're trying to take advantage of for your own personal gain. And that's what he does. Right? So he's, he's, he's abusive, he's selfish, he's self-seeking, and he's a liar. And he's been a liar from the beginning. He's been a murderer from the beginning, and we're going to see that here in a minute. 
Go all the way back to the garden. You think about Adam and Eve. Right? He tricked Adam and Eve to giving up their identity. They walked with God. They had perfect communion with the Father. The Father goes, just don't do this one thing. And the enemy comes in and goes, hey, Eve, let me talk about something here for a minute. You know, your God, your Father, he's kind of holding out on you. You think he's so good, but really he's kind of cheating you. He's leaving you short. And as we know, if you're familiar with the story, right, she falls into that and Adam falls into it because Adam was standing there with her, right? So lest we push everything on to Eve, Adam was standing here in that moment, right? So the guy was standing there with them. So he was deceived as well, right? And he gives up that identity and that relationship because of deception. You're right. Maybe I'll identify myself because then I'll be like God. I'll get all this knowledge and then, then I'll be me instead of accepting who God said they are and made them to be. So he started back all the way back in the garden. And flip with me, if you will, to the book of John. John chapter 8. And Jesus is talking to the Jewish people. And the Jews are sitting there saying that, you know, we are Abraham's offspring. John chapter 8. We'll look at verse 39. Start in verse 39, then we're just going to kind of jump through a few of them. John chapter 8, verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. That is not what Abraham did. Right? And so you got these people that are sitting here and they're identifying themselves and they're true. It's right. right? By physical descent, they're children of Abraham. But that isn't what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is going, let's talk about the spiritual sense. Just because you're physical descendants of Abraham does not mean that you're my children. Don't correlate the two. Don't correlate your physical birth with your in with God, right? While my mom and dad were, you know, my kids, I could look at them and go, you know, well, my dad's a pastor and blah, 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 so thus I'm a kid of God. And, you know, unfortunately, no, they're not. Unless they make the decision. Unless they come to Christ. And they accept that for themselves. Continues on in verse 42. Look at this. Jesus says to them, if God were your father, right? So he's talking to people and he's calling them out. He goes, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not on my own accord, but he sent me. Right? So he's, he's already challenging me. He goes, you, you think you're a child of God, but let me tell you, you're not. Continues on, verse 43. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. Who wants to be called a child of the devil? I mean, I can't sit in that moment and thinking of these Jews, sitting there, thinking that they were part of the, of the, of the, of the in crowd, right? They were part of the Jewish family. They are part of Abraham's family. And like, we're in. And yet Jesus goes, no, 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 sorry. You're a child of the devil. <laughs> Excuse me, Jesus? Uh, no. Hey, we, we've been doing this forever. He goes, sorry, no. You're a child. Of the devil, why? And, and your will is to do your father's desire. And here's the thing about the devil. Look at it. He, he explains it out to him. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. So you think we're going to find true identity in that fatherhood? No way. Right? There's no truth in that father. Continues on, not even that there's no truth. He says, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and a father of lies. Right? And in our, in our fleshly nature, in our separate life you know, before Christ, that was us. And you go, well, no, maybe it's not. Right? Maybe he was just talking to the Jews. Flip with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm laying this groundwork so that we start to see right, just what God has done for us. Right? What, he, what Christ's de life, death, and resurrection has purchased for you and me. Ephesians chapter 2. This used to be our identity. Verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we, who does that include? All of us, <laughs> right? Not a one of us is excluded here. 
we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes, wait a minute. That was me. That was my identity. I was a child of wrath. I had nothing to look forward to but wrath. And so did you. How much better is it to be a child of God? Amen? I, I mean, I don't have to fear that anymore. Neither do you. Right? We've been transferred out of that kingdom of darkness, out of that child of wrath, out of that child of the devil, over to a loving and caring and merciful loving Father. And we're going to see that. You can write down in your notes a few other verses, just things to look at maybe later. You know, you're thinking, is there other spots, right? Other spots. 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. Paul calls somebody out and says, you're a child of the devil. You do nothing righteous. You're against it all. Right? That's kind of my own summation of those, of those two verses. But Acts chapter 13, 9 and 10 talks about Paul calling out somebody as a son of the devil. And then Matthew 13, 38 is just kind of one last one to, you know, that you might want to look at and realize that there is definitely two fathers in the spiritual realm. And every one of us was part of a fatherhood over here. And that's when we look at it and you start to realize why adoption is so important. We start to realize why Ephesians 1, 5 is so crucial because God adopts us. And that means if he's adopting us, that means we were children of another one. Does it not? I don't adopt my own kids, do I? No. So obviously that means if he's adopted us in, we were children of another father. So we need to see that correlation. That in order for God to adopt us, we obviously had to have a different parent. And God wants to reverse that around. And so, but by grace... Right? Notice I remember I said at the beginning, either you're a child of the devil by nature, right? that's what we came out as, or we're a child of God by grace. So, But by grace, you and I are a child of a loving, caring, faithful, selfless father. And the list could go on of adjectives to describe him. If you're still in Ephesians, right, we just read that we're children of wrath. Right? And then you continue to slide down in verse 4, but God... God steps in, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Right? But God. Right? God chooses to step in and says, hey, newsflash, I want you as my child. I want you to experience my love. I want you to experience an identity as my children, as my child going forward. If you're in Ephesians, still slide back to Ephesians chapter 1. Like I said, adoption. Right? You and I have been adopted as sons and daughters. Right? We are children of His. And His love has been there from the beginning. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Even as He chose us in, the, in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him, in love He predestined us for adoption to himself, as sons, through Jesus Christ. Any one of us here this morning that is in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, who has had their sins covered by the blood of the Lamb, who has trusted in him for as their Lord and Savior, right? This adoption is absolutely true, and it says that we are then children of God. We sang the song, right? I'm a child of God, right? We need to let that sink in. And let it penetrate down because there's a lot more to that as a child of God. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says a very similar thing, right? God again breaks in and has predestined us to be adopted as children, right? And, and, and it's over and over and over again throughout Scripture. And what that tells me, right, and what I hope that that would tell you is that God's not surprised by us being his sons and daughters. Right? There was no accidental sons here. Right? God goes, he's not sitting here going, wow, where did you come from, John? I don't understand. How did you get into my house? He goes, no, no, I called you into my house. There's no accidents here. I want you here. I didn't just sneak my way in. God says, no, I adopted you, and I want you to know that you're my beloved son. Flip with me to Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, so a couple of books to the left here, if you're in, in Ephesians still. Romans chapter 8. And we start to realize that all of this happens, you know, through God's plan because he wants Jesus to have many brothers and sisters. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be what? The firstborn among many brothers. Right? God wants his family to be large. Right? He wants Jesus to come forth. He, he sent Christ to go forth to make the way that we could join him as sons that we could join Christ as brothers and sisters and co-heirs with Christ. And we'll look at those probably in the, near, you know, in the future messages that we're co-heirs with Christ, which means an inheritance that never spoils fades, it goes on forever. I don't, I don't think we understand the inheritance we've been given um, because of Christ, but that's there. And then the verse we're going to set on for the rest of this morning, so these are all just kind of preparatory for where we're going. Flip with me to the book of 1 John. This is where we're going to set because we're going to talk about the love of the Father, the love that he has for you and me, a love that's been there from, from the beginning. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. I don't like the given word set there. One, you're, somebody probably has a translation that says that he's lavished on us. Right? It wasn't just this little gift, right? He lavished his love on us, right? That we should be called children of God. And so we are. Right? Let that sink in for a minute. If you've trusted in Christ for salvation, God has lavished his love on you. He's lavished his love on you. He says, you're my son and my daughter. My love is permanently affixed to you today. Permanently. And as I was sitting there, you know, kind of preparing and meditating here this morning, right, I believe there's some that might be here this morning that need to just sit in that and let it, literally let it sink from here. Ali made a mention in worship. Right? It needs to go from our head and it needs to penetrate and it drops down into the heart that I truly am a son of God, because even John reminds his readers, he goes, that we should be called children of God. And oh, by the way, that is what we are. Right? We need to let that drop. You are a child of God here this morning if you've trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation. And God's love is permanently set in your direction. There's nothing that you can do or not do that will change that. And that's pretty freeing when you think about it. That means when he calls me and I screw up and I don't go, he still loves me. That means when you feel called and you don't go and you screw up, he still loves you. It doesn't change. He's still pleased with you. He does, is he going to correct you? Sure. He, you know, his love is, is, is purifying as well, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But his love purifies, his love corrects, his love disciplines, and it's a sign of his love for us that he disciplines us. How many of us have been called things that are not true? Every one of us has probably had falsehood spoken of our lives, have we not? Right? And that's, I guess, again, like I say, why I'm so excited about this series here. Right? We get to see who we truly are. We get to remind ourselves, and I can't encourage us enough as a body of believers, right, that as we go through some of these things, that we would, when we get together with one another, we'd start to speak it to one another. Right? Because this life and the enemy that's against us is so, you know, crazy busy trying to destroy our identity and we need reminders from each other all the time right so when you're with each other right remind each other vicky i loved it this week right we talked in sermon notes right and she goes well you know i'm not going to just walk up to somebody and say i'm a child of the king or i'm a king's child right and i'm like why not that's who you are right? is that not true it's absolutely true and, and you know she's like well i just can't do that but i saw her in walmart and she comes running over to me she goes i'm a child of the king right practice Right? We need to do it, church. It's awkward, maybe, sure, but you know, it's like, hey, if you can start with me in Walmart, perfect. Do it. Right? Because it's true. And the more we speak it about ourselves, and the more we speak it about one another, the more the Holy Spirit will take that and bring it and root it deeper and deeper into our heart, 
So when the enemy comes and tries to speak lies, we'll go, no, 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 that's not true. Right? And so we need to constantly remind ourselves of who we are because of what the Father says, right? We sang the song, he, we, I am who he says I am. Not who I say I am, not who you say I am, I am who he says I am, and it's the same for each one of you here this morning. That you are who he says you are. And so as we go through this, as we define the love of the Father, right, it's true for us as sons and daughters. And maybe you're here this morning and you've not trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, right? Maybe you haven't turned to him, right? And you're like, oh, is this true for me? Right? You just said that if I haven't trusted in Christ, then I'm a child of the devil. And, you know, that's not me saying the words, right? That's God's word. That's not me. That's not my idea. But I want you to know that if you're here this morning, there's probably a really good chance, right, that God the Father is loving you and he's trying to draw you to himself via the Holy Spirit. And he's going, will you listen? Will you hear it? And maybe he's trying to get us to, you know, try to get you to maybe admit in that moment that I need to change. Right? And if that's you and you need to acknowledge it, I want to encourage you, right, to acknowledge your sin and acknowledge your need of a Savior. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, right, if we will confess our sins, our Father is gracious and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? He, he says you'll do it. Right? And, the, and, and the amazing thing about that, the enemy is going to speak to you right now and go, well, that, that's great, right? you'll be forgiven, but you know, it's, not really all, you know, it's not all it cracked up to be. You're not really a child, but that's not true. If, you'll, you know, if, you, if you're in that mindset and you make that prayer and you confess your sin and you acknowledge Him as Lord and you turn, in that moment, right, he calls you son or daughter. It's not an earned position. In that moment, he goes, I've just taken this child of the devil and I went to the adoption market and said, that one, <laughs> they're mine. Here's the price. Here's Jesus' blood. Here it's done. I'm now taking this child out and I'm bringing him over here into my kingdom, into my home, where they'll never have to be worried about being left alone again. That is absolute truth of our Father's love for you this morning. So let's look at that love that he's lavished on us. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, we've already talked about it. Our Father's love is eternal. Eternal. There's no end. Right? He's loved us from the beginning, and he'll love us all the way until he returns or calls us home. He's going to love us for eternity. Look with me to Romans chapter 8. You're sitting there going, oh, that's true. I, my, maybe my, 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 my earthly father was supposed to love me that way. Hasn't been my experience. My mother was supposed to love me that way. Hasn't been my experience. My friends, whatever. They've all said they'll always love me. But I've come to find out that that's not true. Well, all that is is lies straight from the enemy. Because our father's love truly is that way. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Starting in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Continuing on in verse 38, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? Nothing will separate you from the love of the Father. No matter how far you fall, no matter how far into temptation and into sin you fall, your Father's love is still for you. Right? It does not change. Right? And we need to grasp that as children of God because otherwise as a child we're sitting here going, yeah, but I really got to earn his love and there's no freedom in that. Right? God's love is for us always and forever. Right? There's no tragedy that will take him from you. Right? There's no failure you commit that will cause him to go, well, you know what, that's it. My love for John has ran out. I'm done. I've tried enough. <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore. It's not true. Right? And you can put your name in my name, in place of my name. Right? There's nothing, no failure that you'll commit that will cause him to love you less. His love is for you always and forever as his child. 
Maybe that has not been your life experience, and if it has not, I am sorry. Right? That it was not God's intent. That was not God's plan. Right? That is what happened through, because of and through broken people. And this is, in this moment, I believe that God is trying to upend that identity and go, no, no, no. Fathers are meant to love, and I do. And I love you forever and for always. Right? You will not come home one day and find your father gone. Hebrews 13.5. Maybe Hebrews 13.5 says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Right? He's always going to be there. And so, again, right, if that has not been your experience, right, all those things are things that the enemy has tried to use to twist the image of our Heavenly Father. And God wants to untwist those things and make it clear to you this morning that God is always going to be there for you, that there's nothing and he's not going anywhere. Our Father's love is eternal. Our Father's love is personal, right? So often we think God, you know, we take John 3, 16, for God so loved the whole world. <laughs> Great, I, and I, I can grasp that, that's good. But then I got to bring that down and go, well, I'm part of the world, and so God loves me. Anybody struggle with that at times? Maybe I'm the only one, I don't know. That's fine, I'll be, you know, I'll admit it. I, I struggle with the fact that at times God loves me. Right, all of a sudden, God's eyes went from the world, and he went, Whoop. John, I love you. Wait a minute, God, I don't know if I believe that. Right, and so there's this challenge that goes on. Right? It's personal. One author says that he doesn't just love you, he likes you. There's a big difference between the two. Right? He likes you. He enjoys spending time with you. Think about that. The creator of all the heavens and the earth, the, the, I mean, the great I am, enjoys spending time with people like us. He enjoys it. And you go, well, you know, how do I know that that's true? Zephaniah 3.17 says he delights and rejoices over you. And he's speaking to Israel in that moment. And now you tie that back and you realize that you know, our Heavenly Father rejoices over us as his children. Right? He's happy to spend time with you. He looks forward to spending time with you. I was brought back to Matthew chapter 6. If you're, if you're not there, go ahead and flip to Matthew chapter 6. It's the Lord's Prayer. And it starts off with Father. Right? There's that word again, Father. But if you think about it, when in Jesus' day, the Aramaic that he would have spoken right, would have been Abba. So if you're in, in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, am I in the right spot maybe? 6, 9 through 13, yeah, 9 through 13. Right, they're asking him to teach him how to pray, and he says, pray like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, right? As lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Right, that word Father, right, would have been Abba, which means Daddy. A little bit more personal, doesn't it not? Right? I always knew when, you know, oh, I'm going to talk about my father, I'm going to speak about him, but yet when I was a kid, it's like, there's dad. There's daddy. He's the one that I want to spend time with, right? And that's where it starts to shift. We start to realize that he's not just some distant deity out there that, yes, he, is he deserving of all reverence and awe? Absolutely. But that's the crazy thing of who he is. He's God the Father. So he's God and he deserves all this reverence. But let's not get stuck there. Right? He's daddy. He's sitting there and going, my arms are open. Come talk to me. Right? And so um, Eric Geiger puts it this way. He goes, if that's true, right? and then you can take this prayer and go, then daddy, your name is holy. Daddy, your kingdom come and your will be done. Daddy, will you provide for me? Daddy, will you forgive me? Daddy, guide and protect me. Right? There's this, this term of endearment. There's this, there's this closeness. There's this intimacy. In our Father's love. He's not distant. He wants to be up close with his children. And that's you and I if we've trusted in Christ. That's our identity. That our God is not some far off removed Father. He's intimately involved in your life. And you will know he's not. Well, he hasn't moved. Right? If you're not sensing his intimacy, chances are it's on us. Because he's sitting here going, I want to. And I'm like, oh, God, I know I'm just too busy. I, don't, I know I got this, and I got this, and I got this, and I got this, and I got this. And he goes, yeah, <laughs> nice. 
Right? How intimate is any relationship on a horizontal platform if that's the case? Right? To be intimate, it takes time together. It spends, it's spending time together. It's, it's getting close with one another. It's all those things. Our Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, desires to have that kind of intimate involvement in your life. Our Father's love is personal. Not only is it personal, right? So it's eternal, it's personal, but our Father's love is also intentional. It goes back to that idea of adoption, right? He intentionally chose you and me. He's intentional to pay the price and to go forth. Right? And as I said earlier, you're not an accident. You're not a surprise. Flip with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, here's the story of David. He's become king. There's some things that go on typically when you become a king. And those things continued on for many, many years. They continued on through a lot of the kingship, right? Is that when you became a king, you had the right to put to death everybody else in the previous king. All their family, all their lands, all those things, I, it was my right to put them to death. Right? Because I don't need competition. Right? But you start to look at this, and we're going to see that adoption is even back here, that, uh, that heart of adoption, that desire to bring people in, out inside of themselves. Verse 1, right? David's in his kingship. He comes in verse 1 of chapter 9, 2 Samuel. David said, is there still anyone left? of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Right, here he has this intimate relationship with Saul's son. Right, they were, I mean, they were bonded together. Right, they were kind of soulmates, if you will, as, as, as close as brothers you know, could be. And they, I mean, he's there and he goes, you know what, if there's anybody, is there anybody left in Saul's household that I can show kindness to? Anybody, find them. And then all of a sudden a servant comes up and goes, hey, there is one. <laughs> there's one. Right? And I can imagine, you know, David's kind of probably excited about it. Right? And they, all of a sudden he finds out, right? And after he sends, intentionally gives them mercy, and he slides down, and all of a sudden it's Mephibosheth. He goes, there's, this, there's, this, there's this, this, this one out there, it's Mephibosheth. And, you know, but yet we find out he's crippled. <laughs> Mephibosheth is crippled in both feet. He can't really do anything. What good is he to David's kingdom? Nothing. Right? <laughs> Might as well just get rid of him. He's not worth anything. Anybody here feel that way at times? Right? I'm not worth anything. All I do is screw up, God. What would you want to do with me? Right? I've been there. I'm there at times. Right? God, what? I, I don't get it. I'm this broken individual, and yet you still, you want me? He goes, yes, I want you. David wanted this person of Jonathan's family as well. Right? Nephi Bosheth comes thinking he's probably being put to death. Right? He's been maybe out there hiding and going, I need to cover myself. I'll just, you know, I'll just live this lowly life. And he comes in, and you look at verse 7. Slide down 9, 2 Samuel 9, verse 7. Mephibosheth answers him in verse 6, Behold, I am your servant. Verse 7, And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. <laughs> right? So here's this person that David absolutely owes nothing to. This guy should be out there left to his own device, left as a peasant, never to have anything ever again. And yet David says, find them, bring them to me. And then he brings them in and he goes, here you go, Matthew Bosheth, everything is going back to you. And not as only is everything going back to you, at the end of verse 7, what does it say? And you shall eat at my table always. You shall eat at my table always. Right? Basically, he goes, Mephibosheth, guess what? You're now part of my family. There's not a mealtime that I don't want you here. Our Heavenly Father is the same way. He's prepared a table. And he says, come. I want you at my table always. There's nothing that will disqualify you. Right? If you're in Christ, right? again, we're going to look at it in a minute. He's going to discipline. He's not happy if we're in sinful lifestyle. But it's not disqualifying. It's not shifting his love going, I don't want you here. That's not true. Our Father always 
wants us there. I want to read you a portion of how this was read out in, this, in, in a book in, by Eric Geiger in relation to this portion of Scripture. I think he says it pretty clearly. You were crippled by sin, and you deserve death. Every one of us, correct? We can all admit to that fact, hopefully. right? We were all crippled by sin and deserve death. Yet God has given you a new life by adopting you. Just as David searched for Mephibosheth, God searched for you. And he asked, is there anybody? Go find them. God is asking us still that today, is he not? Is there anybody? Go find them. Right? As his sons and daughters, he goes, go find them. Bring them here. I want, I want to see them. I want them to know something. Right? So just as David searched for him, he searches for us. Just as David gave Methibosheth a place at the table, God invited him to, to his family and gave you a place at the table. Just as David assumed responsibility for Mephibosheth, God assumed responsibility for you. Remember, he was crippled. Could he make a living? Nope. Could he provide for himself? Nope. So David goes, guess what? I know that that's all true, but guess what? I'm going to provide for you. Our Heavenly Father does the same thing for us. And just as David intentionally offered mercy, God intentionally offered mercy to you and me. Right? That, that story, when you think about it, is such a picture of the adoption that's taken place of you and me. And that's all the way back in 2 Samuel. That's all Old, you know, old Testament, Old Covenant stuff. And yet the idea of adoption is even there. Adoption has always been on God's mind. Right? He's always known that because of the fall, he's going to have to take people out of the enemy's family, out of the devil's family, and bring them over and adopt them into his. Right? And he sent his son so that that would happen. His love is never ending. Continues on, his love is unconditional. God's love is unconditional. How many of us have conditional love? <laughs> right? We all have it. It's all right. right? It needs to go. It needs to be purged. But we are, we're pretty conditional at times. Right? Our Father's love is not. Our Father's love is very unconditional. And I encourage you one day to go through, if you haven't, or maybe you haven't read it in a while, go back and read the story of the prodigal son. Where we make so much about the prodigal son. And how this prodigal son leaves and goes and takes his inheritance and he goes and squanders it out there on wild living and the worldly stuff, right? And then he's in there with the pigs and he's eating their food and that's an absolute no-no for the Jewish people, right? Because pigs were unclean and all that stuff. And he comes to his senses and goes, what am I doing? I'm just going to go home and be part of my father's, you know, I'm going to go back and ask my father to be one of his servants because his servants are living better than me right now. They're not eating pig slop. So I'll go back and just be a servant. I can't be his son. I've done too much. I've gone too far. I've squandered half of his inheritance and he didn't even need to, give, need to give it to me to begin with. And I threw it all away. And maybe we're sitting here as a father going, yeah, if my kids ever took half of my money and went and squandered it, don't bother coming back and asking me for more. Right? That'd be a very natural response. And so we make much about this prodigal son who goes and he does these things and he comes back to his senses. And yet we, we, we fail to remember right, that there's his father sitting on the porch waiting for him to return, is he not? His heavenly father is sitting there, right, looking out over the horizon going, is he coming? Is he there? Has anybody seen or heard of him? Right? And this is why I say his love is unconditional because flip with me real quick. If you're not there, flip with me to Luke 15. But our Father's love is unconditional, right? And it frees us as His sons and daughters, church. But when we truly understand that our Father is not sitting here saying, you, have, you better be perfect or I'm not going to love you. It's not true. Luke chapter 15. I already kind of gave you the, the, the caught you up in it for a minute, but slide to verse 24. And we'll pick up where this prodigal son decides he's going home. And he arose and came to his father, verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion on him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. 
for this son of mine was dead (laughs) and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Here's this father who goes, I gave you half of everything. Now you're coming back to here? (laughs) No way. That isn't his response. right? And so just as much as this thing could be a story about the prodigal son, it could be the story about the loving, unconditional love of the father, which it portrays. Right? When we fall short, when we go and squander our inheritance that God has given us, right? when we come to our senses and go, boy, how did I screw up? Right? And we come back to God and we go, God, I, I messed up. And he's already sitting here going, my son, my daughter, come. Right? That's who he is. Unconditional. Unconditional love. Now, now mind you, this not, I'm not equating unconditional love over here to before Christ. Right? Coming to God is conditional. We have to turn. We need to repent. Right? We have a part. But once we're in His family, His love doesn't stop ever. And the enemy would want you to believe anything but that. Right? Don't believe that. That's not true. Your God's love is conditional. So you better keep in line. There's no freedom there, church. Our Father wants us and has come that we might live in freedom, we might live in abundance. And on a very small, small scale, right? It wasn't very small at the moment. On a small scale, I was blessed with a picture of the Father's unconditional love in my own life. I actually still have it in my wallet. I think I've shared this in the past, right? And so I, I, I was in getting ready for ministry. I had a job. I was doing well. We had an, you know, a family that was growing up, and we had all the things we ever wanted, and God calls me into ministry, and I'm sitting here, and I'm going, oh boy, I don't know what to do here. You know, I, I feel I need to make that plunge, but you know, I, in my own flesh, right, I wanted to please my earthly father. Right? And, I, and I, so I had this thought rolling around in my head that, you know, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that. And, you know, and finally I went up and I told my dad, thinking I was fully discouraging him because I was stepping away from corporate America. I was giving up really kind of everything. Right? And, and I told him and, you know, didn't have a whole lot to say in the moment. And the day went on and I left. And it was, I think, a day later, two days later. Um, I had gotten done with work. I had checked out. And I went to my car, and my dad delivered UPS for delivered for UPS at the time, and he delivered to my place of business. And one day, unbeknownst to me, he went into my car and he placed this note. Obviously, somewhat important. I've had it here for almost 15 years, right? And, it, and it's just a small picture of unconditional love, right? He he goes, whatever you decide about work or school, I'll respect it. It's yours and Mary's decision. We are behind whatever you decide. Love always, Dad. Right, and it's, this is why I say I think it's so important, church, how we respond to one another. Right, because that little moment, right, like I said, it's been in my wallet for 14 years, and until it disintegrates, it'll probably stay there because it's a constant reminder that unconditional love is true. It's possible. Right, our Father loves us that way. And we're supposed to love each other that way too. So as children of God, we are, we are gifted with God's unconditional love to you and me. Do not let the enemy take that truth away. God's love is also generous. right? He takes full responsibility for you. Don't forget that. We read in Philippians 4.19 that he says that God will supply all of your needs. There's nothing he won't supply. He's got it all. Cattle on a thousand hills, it's his. Everything in this world is his. Right? And our Father generously gives it. Right? And we get to experience that. His love is generous. He constantly pours it out. So often we just miss it because we're trying to earn it on our own and look at what I did. And God goes, no, 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 let me show you. Let me, let me pour my, inherit- my, my, my provision out to you. And then the last one is love is purifying. His love is purifying. God desires you and I to be holy, correct? Anybody holy yet? <laughs> I'm not. I, I, I'm a work in process, thank you, Lord. Right? I've got a long ways to go, and the longer I go down this road, I think the farther along I, or the less along I find out I am. Right? I've I, I got more work to do than I think, but our God desires us to be holy. 
And so when I think about his love being purifying, right, he's more concerned about your character and your transformation than your happiness and your comfort. Like God's not too concerned about those things. Not that, he's not, you know, not that he's not concerned, but if he's forced to choose, right? let's see, I can give John all this comfort and you know, happiness, or I can mold his character into my son. He's going to mold my character into his son first. It's the same for you, right? That's what he's concerned with first and foremost, right? is that we become like his son. Romans 8, 29, we read it earlier, right? that we'd be predestined to be conformed to Christ. Right? That's his goal. He wants us to be like Jesus. And so along the road, when we... In our own flesh, go, yeah, you know what, Father? Sorry, never mind. I'm not listening to you. And just like we did to our earthly fathers, right? We've probably all done that. We walked away and go, yep, I'll take care of that. I'll hop right on that. And then we never do. Right? So when that happens, what did your earthly fathers do? Probably disciplined you, correct? Maybe it didn't feel very good at the moment. Maybe you didn't like it very much. But flip with me to the book of Hebrews because we're going to find out that Discipline, coming from the Father, is really a demonstration that we are His children. And if we're not being disciplined by God, if there is nothing there, kind of, like I said, not all the time, but when we fall short and there's not discipline, we should question, who's my Father right now? Where am I? Right? Discipline from our Father is not, is not harsh. Right? I think he's brought, that God brought the idea of tough love into the, pit, into the picture right, for us down this path. Hebrews chapter 12. Starting in verse 7. Actually, we'll slide back up to verse 5. Right? Don't grow weary in that stuff. He goes, And if you've forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, do not, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives, right? So if we're not being disciplined by the Lord, maybe we're not his sons, because Scripture clearly teaches that if we're sons, he's going to discipline. It continues on. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So next time on, the, on, on a practical scale, right, if you're, if you're a, a child here this morning, right, and you're listening, right, if you're being disciplined in, in, in a Christ-like, God-fearing home, right, your mother and your father might be disciplining you because they truly love you. Right? They truly want what's best for you. It doesn't seem like it's very good at the moment because that, well, you know, that ain't what's best for me. I, I can't, no, they're doing what's best. Right? And maybe we need to receive that and see it that way, that we're sons. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, when you, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. Hmm. Right? God disciplines us because he loves us as sons, and he wants us to be holy. Discipline isn't bad, church. Discipline is actually a sign that our Father loves us. It's a sign that I'm a child of God. Because the enemy is going, go live it up. Have fun. That's what the enemy is going to do. That's what the Father of lies is going to do. And our Heavenly Father goes, no, stop. Don't do it. Right? I have a different plan for you. I'm looking at my time. It's already getting late. Um, there's three things at the end, and we'll, co- we'll catch them next week. I want to mention them. I don't know. Do you have a song for communion, by the way? Okay. If you want to come forward and kind of prep for communion. But there's three things that as a response as children of God. And then it'll, it'll, we'll expand, and I'll, and I'll wrap up this up next week. But I just want you to think about it. Right? As a child, we should trust, obey, and reflect the Father. And we're going to expl- we'll blow those up next week. Right, because I think we need to stop here and just let that reality of the love that the Father has for you and for me as children, to let that truly penetrate and sink in. To realize before I ask you to do anything, that before there's any you know, commands by God or by me as we look through these things of how we're supposed to respond to, we need to let that sink in that this is true whether we do it or not. 
Right? His love is for you and not against you. His love is there to cover all those things, whether you do all these things perfectly or not. Whether you believe it this morning or not, right? His love as a child of God is for you. Let that penetrate. Let that sink in. And then we'll come back next week and we'll think about you know, the, the, the response to and the, and the actions of a child of the King. So as you, you have probably elements with you, um, just kind of hold those things in your hand here and just think about those things that our Heavenly Father demonstrated His love by sending Jesus Christ, which those elements represent, to pay the price to adopt you as a son or a daughter here this morning. And that's what we come to the communion table reminding ourselves of, of, the, of, of who we were apart from Christ as children of the devil and who we now are as children of God. Right? And so as Ali sings the song, and you know, I don't know if there's going to be lyrics up there or not, but um, you can join in if you know the song, and then we'll come back and we'll take the Lord's Supper together as a family. Wounded and forsaken, I was scattered by the sword. Broken and forgotten, feeling lost and all alone. And summoned by the King into the Master's court. I'm lifted by the Savior and I'm cradled in His arms. I am carried to the table, seated where I don't belong. I am carried to the table, I'm swept away by His love. Father God, we thank you for carrying us to the table. Father, we thank you that your love is, <laughs> is vast and it was there in the beginning and it will be there forever. Lord, that it is your love and your purpose that adopted us, that brings us there, that I feel so oftentimes we don't belong and the enemy would have us believe that to be true and it's not. Father, I can't pray enough that 
each one of us here this morning, here at, at, in the building and online, would truly grasp that we're children of God. That we are sons and daughters of the Most High. That we are loved with a love that is beyond measure. And there's great freedom in knowing that we're children. Knowing that we are accepted. Knowing that, our, that, that we are loved unconditionally. It gives us the freedom to make mistakes. It gives us the freedom to take risks. It gives us the freedom to step out in faith, trusting that you'll meet us in that spot. And if we make a mistake, if we miss here, we don't have to sit back and go, God, oh my, what are you going to do to me? No. He says, I got you. Let me pick you up and dust you off and, and heal you and let me send you back out again. God, we thank you for your love that brings us to the table. That's made it possible. We thank you for sending Jesus to pay our sin debt, God. A debt we couldn't possibly afford to pay. Separated out from relationship with you. And you wanted us to be back into an intimate relationship with you. Would you help us to receive that this morning? Would you help us to remind us that that what we hold in our hands was what made the way for that to happen? That we wouldn't take it lightly, God. That we would remember the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that we would, would constantly give thanks for opening up that way. So as we take off that top layer and, and take out the bread, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your body. We thank you that you willingly allowed it to be beaten and broken, that, our, that we might become sons and daughters of the kings. We take the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for us. And as we take back that next layer, revealing the juice, representing his blood. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for the willingness to shed your blood. That, Lord, without the shedding of your blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. There is no hope for us. And so we thank you for willingly being, um, willingly shedding it. We thank you, God, for sending him to be that sacrifice to shed his blood. We thank you for the forgiveness and the covering of it that it represents. And let us not take it lightly, Lord. I pray that each one of us, when we fall short, we would confess it and we would come to the table knowing that there's forgiveness for it. That we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sins. So we take that, reminding ourselves of Jesus' blood. Lord, help us to walk in this identity. Help the identity as a child to sink and penetrate into our hearts, that we would live out of it, that we would live joyfully knowing that our Father is for us and not against us, and believes in us and has a purpose for us as his children. And he asks us to go forth and to do that. Let us find joy in serving you, Father, because of all that you have done for us. We would lovingly lay down our lives in response to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week.